The following PowerPoint goes along with the land and water objectives. Um, so make sure that you've printed these out and you are ready to write as I go through each objective. Okay, so the first objective um, says to define the Green Revolution, give positives and negatives, and to know how it has helped developing countries. Um, the definition you can see on the screen, it's using modern machines and techniques to yield more food per acre along with high varieties. You should know that Norman Borlaug is the father of the Green Revolution. And this took place between the 1940s and the 1950s. Norman Borlaug is credited with saving one billion people from starvation. And he introduced short stem miracle wheat to Mexico and other Asian countries. The positives of the Green Revolution would be that now we just have more food per person and that developing countries are able to produce food for the people that live in that country. We have an expanding population and so this is helpful because we have more food and more plants that are giving us higher yield. Some negatives associated with the Green Revolution would be um, the modern machinery now that we are using is going to use fossil fuels and contribute to air pollution. Another criticism of the Green Revolution Developing countries are now more reliant on highly developed countries for the modern machines and te techniques. Number two, define sustainable agriculture, drip irrigation, intercropping, and crop rotation. Sustainable agriculture or sustainable farming, as you can see on the screen, is using the farmland for today, but making sure that future generations have access to that farmland or that agricultural land. And that's just the plain definition of sustainability. Please excuse this interruption. There is a system network outage at this time. Oops, and we had a little interruption from um, Mrs. Gorin. All right, so our sustainable techniques. To go through some examples, make sure you can list sustainable farming techniques. We've gone through these between the food chapter um, and as well as our pesticides chapter. So make sure that you can name some examples of sustainable farming techniques. But just to go through a few, the first one here is drip or trickle irrigation. Drip or trickle irrigation saves water. And you can see here on the screen, we have a pipe that is connected to a water source. And so now that water is going to be pushed through that metal pipe. The metal pipe has holes that are now going to distribute water directly to the root of the crop. So this is saving water compared to conventional techniques of just using sprinkler heads or spraying the water into the atmosphere because that water could possibly evaporate or not make it onto the intended crop. Some other ways that we could save water, um, you could also save um, watering the crops during the nighttime versus the daytime. Laser leveling we discussed. Um, so making sure the farmland is even so that water doesn't uh, move to little pockets that are lower than the surrounding areas. Crop rotation. Uh, crop rotation, as you probably are sick of hearing, is the changing of crop from season to season or year to year. So every year we're going to grow and harvest a different crop. Um, the benefits of crop rotation would be that it's going to reduce the amount of pesticides 
that we're going to need to use on the crops. The reason why is because corn may attract a certain pest, but if we change it to soybeans for the following year, the second year, then it's going to attract a different pest. And then the soybean pest will leave. The oats pest will then uh, immigrate to the farm. And so it doesn't allow one pest to increase in numbers and make it very difficult to control that pest. So it can help reduce the amount of pesticides that are being used. Another reason why you would want to use crop rotation would be that it will, if you pick the proper crops, they will use different minerals and nutrients out of the soil. So if you used oats one year, you may want to grow alfalfa the next year. Many crops um, that are legumes, like soybeans, they have nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in the roots, and they fix atmospheric nitrogen into more usable forms for the crops. So it's actually putting nitrogen into the soil. Intercropping. Intercropping, you can see here, is when you grow crops side by side. So you're alternating rows of crops. In class, if you remember, we talked about uh, intercropping corn and molasses grass. So the reason why you would pick those two crops is that molasses grass uh, releases a chemical that is going to be toxic or poisonous to corn borers. So this will help to reduce the, the amount of corn borers on the corn crop. Therefore, reduce pesticides. Number three, tragedy of the commons. Um, tragedy of the commons is a theory by Garrett Hardin. You guys maybe remember reading the essay, Tragedy of the Commons, that he wrote. And throughout the article, he discusses how people are more willing to act in their own self-interest than for the good of the environment. He defines commons, and we can think of many different commons around us, but he defines them as the ocean, could be the air, could be water, animals, minerals, national forests, fish, and if you exploit the commons, then you become rich. But just to remember, the commons is something that's free. Everybody has access to the commons. I think we said maybe your desks are a great example. So for your desks, everybody is going to sit there throughout the day. And if you pollute it, if you write on it, if you put gum underneath it, it's convenient for the person who's doing that because they don't have to get up and throw it in the garbage. But the tragedy is that everybody who sits there is going to have to deal with gum underneath their desk. Now, how do we fix tragedy of the commons? Well, people are less willing to pollute something or to degrade something that they own. So if you bought a desk and you had to carry it from class to class, you'd be more willing to keep it clean. You would make sure there was no writing on it. You would never put gum underneath your desk. Forest management. Oops. 
sorry, number four. There, I don't think there's a slide for number four throughout these PowerPoint slides. So it says to define land rec reclamation and give examples. Land reclamation means to restore land to its original state. To restore land to its original state or close to its original state. An example, if you have land that was surface mined, after all of the minerals have been extracted from that mine, then the land should be restored. So what would happen would be that the soil would be put back into the area, the hole where the minerals were extracted. Plants would be planted there, or seeds would be planted there, in order to grow um, plants and eventually trees. And the point is to make it back to its original state. Many times this is not an easy task. It's difficult to do. And it doesn't get back to its original state. As you can see for the next question, it talks about describing and defining methods to manage and harvest trees. So we have our selective cutting, shelter wood, cutting, clear cutting, seed tree cutting. All of this, you can see the page number in the Barron's book. This may be um, an incorrect page number if you have a newer Barron's book. This is for the ones that I gave you. And basically what you need to know is that the AP exam is concerned with clear cutting, the AP writers. They may ask you a better technique than clear cutting. And if that was an essay question, you could discuss selective cutting. Here you can see selective cutting is when um, the mature trees are cut down, but most of the forest is kept intact. This obviously is beneficial for biodiversity and it helps to reduce erosion. Shelterwood cutting, also better than clear cutting. Um, this is just removing um, trees over time. You're leaving trees intact. You're allowing large, older trees to shelter young trees. And then every decade or so, you come through and you cut down the mature trees. Seed tree cutting, you can see that this land is becoming a little bit more barren. Here, almost all the trees are harvested, and whatever trees are left over are going to regenerate the forest. And then you're clear cutting. But this is the one that you should really make sure that you understand and the problems associated with clear cutting. So you can see removal of all trees from an area. Most cost effective, a logging company is going to make the most money from clear cutting, but it's the worst for the environment. So you're removing all of the trees in an area, and because you're removing all of the trees, you can see here, we have the process of desertification taking place, so it's very desert-like. It may be difficult to regrow trees or plants in this area. It's gonna increase erosion, decrease biodiversity, and we really don't quite understand all of how desertification works in the long term. So this could be a permanent situation here. If there's no soil present, then it would have to go through the um, primary succession. If there is soil present, then it would be secondary succession. The answer to logging and removing trees would be to remove trees in patches. So instead of clear cutting, to go into a forest and remove small section at, sections at a time. And again, it's to keep the rest of the trees for biodiversity and to reduce erosion. All right, number six, define habitat fragmentation and its effect on species diversity. 
So don't forget, and we've said this many times in class, the number one reason why animals become endangered or extinct is due to loss of habitat. You can see from this little cartoon here, um, we're really allotting only small areas. This is an example of an island um, for our wildlife. And we have the destruction of the habitat. That means that we're just destroying the habitat. We're removing the habitat many times to change it into, um, it could be agricultural land. It could be for homes. So we're removing the land, we're destroying it. Fragmentation, so habitat fragmentation, means that we are going to basically cut up or divide up the habitat. So in this picture in the top right corner, you can see how this habitat is fragmented. Many times roads being built in the, through the middle of a habitat or through the middle of a forest, it's going to break up the habitat. So animals are unable to cross. You can see this road here. And we set a way that we could um, help fix habitat fragmentation or habitat corridors, if you remember. So maybe you build like a little bridge or you have um, the cars go over areas where animals can get from like the north to the south side. And degradation really is referring to pollution. So we're degrading them um, by polluting. And so this, these are the main reasons why animals become endangered or extinct. Number seven says to describe how lack of genetic diversity impacts the production of crops. Um, this is a direct effect. It increases the probability of widespread disease outbreak. So when we are going to lower the genetic diversity, we are going to have a uniform makeup of a crop because it's going to give us the highest yields or we're going to have a farm, which is a monoculture. We're going to grow the same crop or plant. Um, when we're, ha we're having this. Excuse this interruption again. All testing can be resumed. Please note that students may be to um, So as we were saying, um, we're going to increase the probability of widespread disease. Um, we see this when we have a genetically uniform uniform crop. An example could be the great potato fa uh, famine with our potato blight, as you can see up here. In the United States, we had Russian aphids that were um, targeting our wheat. We had the same wheat crop. So lowering genetic diversity is going to increase the spread, likelihood of the spread of disease. All right, number eight. We're going to go through these federally owned lands. Um, our first one, national parks. Remember, national parks, um, land set aside for recreation and preservation. We are allowed to go to national parks. We pay an entry fee. There may be visitor centers in national parks. You may take tours on roads. Recreation, so you can go hunting in some areas of a national park. Camping. Um, and it is overseen by the national park system. And an example, Everglades National Park. National wildlife refuges. Um, these are areas many times set aside 
for conservation of a specific animal or a plant. So it's managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And maybe you can remember this one because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service services also oversee the endangered and threatened species. So they're in charge of the conservation of wildlife. So it's set aside for the conservation of plants and animals. And the first one, if you guys remember, in 1903, we had Pelican Island, which is the first wildlife refuge, in order to um, save the brown pelican. And then an example around here, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. National forests. National forests are managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Here you can see in the dark green are national forests and grasslands. You should know that most of our national forests are located in the western part of the United States. National forests are federally owned lands that can be used for recreation. We also harvest some timber from the national forest. And then your last one, the wilderness areas. So it's important to differentiate the wilderness areas versus the other federally owned lands. The wilderness, you can see land completely set aside, no development permitted. No roads. The Wilderness Act of 1964 was a law which gave the president the right to set aside these areas. They can be found inside national parks, national forests, wildlife refuges. And they're overseen by the Bureau of Land Management along with um, wherever they're found. So if they're found in a national forest, the U.S. Forest Service, if a wilderness area is found in a national park, National Park Service, and if it's in um, a wildlife refuge, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it just depends on where the wilderness area is found. Wilderness areas are given the highest protection of any federally owned land. And this is the one where there's no construction of roads, logging, or and mining that takes place. It was originally set aside for just the animals that live there. All right, so positives and negatives of pesticides and the use of biological and genetic controls. So just looking at pesticides, um, you need to know the benefits of using pesticides. The main benefit is that it increases crop production. So farmers save money by using pesticides because they're not having to lose their crops to pests. Um, we also see a decrease in disease. We talked about DDT and how developing countries continue to use DDT, which is a pesticide. Countries in Sub-Saharan Africa use it in order to kill the mosquitoes, and mosquitoes carry diseases such as malaria and dengue fever. Some of our negatives associated with pesticides, we said genetic resistance, which is a major problem. So it's called the pesticide treadmill. And the pesticide treadmill, you can see, um, begins with pesticide application on a farm. Most of the pests are going to be killed. A few resistant pests are going to move on. They are genetically resistant to the pesticide. Those resistant pests that move on, they're going to increase in number. And now we're going to have a new population of genetically resistant pests. 
so then we increase the pesticide application. Again, we're going to kill pests, but the resistant ones are going to survive and mate. And then this is going to happen over and over and over again. And this is called the pesticide treadmill. So we're going around in circles, just like the belt of a treadmill. And we're trying to keep up with the genetic resistance. The way to reduce genetic resistance, um, utilizing integrated pest management, or IPM, you would need to change up your pesticide. So after you've applied even more pesticide, change to a different pesticide. And then also you could use, like I said, some of those techniques that we discussed with IPM, integrated pest management, such as biological controls, um, using the predator of a pest, using genetically modified um, crops. Um, so we talked about BT corn. So BT corn now is going to have a gene from the bacterium BT and it's going to be able to resist pests. Using pheromone traps, hormones, crop rotation, intercropping. Oh, here they are. IPM, here are your tools. Resistant to crop varieties, like I said, genetically modified crops, uh, natural enemies, so the biological controls, pheromone traps, um, a small use of pesticides, and pesticides that are maybe are least harmful or least toxic to the environment. Cultivation practices like crop rotation, intercropping, creating a refuge or an area for the predator of the pest to survive. And then all of these are called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Okay, our Organic Food Production Act. I don't see a slide here for number 11, but it says to define overgrazing and the major effects. So I'm just going to go over that first. So overgrazing is when land is exposed to intensive grazing by livestock. And the land doesn't have enough time to recover. So intensive grazing by livestock, and the land doesn't have time to recover, and that's what overgrazing is. So too many um, animals and livestock on, a, on an area, rangeland or farm. Some problems with overgrazing, you should think, desertification can occur. So if the grasses are unable to grow back, um, we're going to see some erosion. It can be very desert-like. And then the, the land may be unusable. Number 12, define the Organic uh, Food Production Act of 1990. So the Organic Food Production Act, we talked about the definition. These are crops that are grown in soil that has been free of commercial inorganic fertilizers and pesticides for three years. Trace amounts are permitted. So if there's a farm nearby that uses fertilizers or pesticides, very small amounts are allowed or permitted. No genetically modified organisms. For livestock, no antibiotics, no hormones, and free range. So they would free range, they cannot be kept in pens. So some ways that a farmer could farm without pesticides and fertilizers, we looked at the bug vac, which was at the front, uh, the first picture on the pesticide and on chapter slides. Pheromones can be used, all of the tools from integrated pest management. Crop rotation, 
you know that organic food is more expensive could be 30% more expensive than uh, non-organic food and number 13 what is an old growth forest and where is the largest where is the largest one in the United States um, you should know that the old growth forest is also known as a virgin forest also considered a climax community when we talk about succession. Um, in the United States, we have Tongass National Forest, which is in Alaska. Um, old growth forests have trees that are of great age with minimal disturbances. And because they're old, they have unique features. We see decaying wood on the ground, lots of fungi in this ecosystem that are breaking down the wood and organic materials that fall to the bottom. An indicator species, an example would be like the northern spotted owl. They're very sensitive to change, so they indicate if there's something um, happening, like habitat destruction, in the old growth forest. And that is your last slide. Um, I will make another video for energy. And don't forget uh, your quiz on this, um, the land and water, plus the energy will be on Tuesday. So objectives for both will be collected on Tuesday in class.